Hello, this is National Master Spencer Feingold back at the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta with another lecture in our series on uh, endgames, little endgame lecture. And uh, today we're going to be looking at weak pawns. You know, what are weak pawns? I don't know. Well, I learned for the lecture. But we'll learn what they are and how to exploit them and how important they are and all that good stuff. So, and feel free if you're in uh, the Zoom call to, uh, generally you should have your audio muted, but I'll ask some questions throughout the, uh, throughout the lecture, and if you have the right answer, feel free to chime in whenever you, whenever you feel like it. But all right, actually, let's start right here in our first position. This is uh, a game, Lasker against Capablanca, from, uh, let me see, let me see the year here, I got my notes, 1921, exactly 100 years ago. Pretty cool. And we're, okay, we're not in the end game yet, I'll admit it. <laughs> we bought, have queens on the board. It's a lot of material for an end game. Uh, but we will get to the end game shortly when the queens get traded. And I wanted to start here because Capablanca with black played a really good idea. And so maybe if you're thinking, you know, in, in the Zoom call here, you, you can take a moment to try to find the best move. Uh, or if you're watching on YouTube, this would be a good time to pause actually and try to figure out the best idea for black. And keep the, uh, keep the title of the, of the lecture in mind, by the way. So if you ever have an idea, you can just chime in. Black to play. What did Capablanca go for? Pretty tough. Pretty tough stuff. Oh, looks like we got a chat, <laughs> maybe. A little typed in the chat, but uh, like I mentioned, I'm not going to actually read the chat, so you're going to have to unmute and tell me what it's all about. Okay. Uh, what about A5? A5. Good idea. Uh, what's, wh what's the continuation? Oh, no, I just thought because it's uh, about weak pawn structures, you would be thinking about breaking down the pawn structure on the queen side. Absolutely. Yeah, A5, A4, right? A5, A5 A4. Give him an isolated pawn, an isolated B pawn. That's exactly right. And you did a great job using the, um, using the, like I said, the theme of the lecture. Uh, wait, let's see. We got, have to admit him again? Okay. Sure. But yeah, making the, the weak pawn, the isolated pawn, that's a great example of a, of a weak pawn, an isolated pawn. And so that's exactly the right idea, and that's exactly what Capablanca goes for. And after he makes that isolated B pawn, Lasker will have two isolated pawns, because his, his, his D pawn is already isolated. So that's what happens. Okay, let's see. Yeah, let's go on here. And Lasker trades those queens, which is the best idea, actually. I mean, Black's queen is pretty good, and the D pawn was, was so weak that he couldn't move his queen. All right, now here's a nice idea by Capablanca. He goes for rook b6, enticing rook d3, and then rook a6. Now he can get in on the second rank because he provoked rook d3. Pretty nice stuff. You know, you'd expect as much from, from Capablanca. That's his style, right? Lasker plays the best move. He goes for g4. It might seem a little drastic, but he's got to do something here. Uh, after on passant, He's, uh, he's, he's traded a pawn from, on the H file for, for the F pawn, right? So normally that's going to favor black. Uh, but at least he, he can kick the knight away from F5. He's trying to play G4. He can even try, if he really wants to, you know, if he's really lucky, I guess, he can try to get H4, H5, and even make a pass pawn of his own. It's sort of a dream because, of course, white's going to have to spend time protecting his weak pawns that black's going to be attacking. But, you know, if black somehow doesn't get enough pressure, then, then white might be able to do that. So, yeah, this was the right idea. But anyways, he wants to kick the knight away. The knight will get off of d4, at least temporarily, and then we can move our pieces. And this is the problem with having weak pawns. If your opponent's attacking them, you either have to lose the pawns, which is not great, or play passively and defend them with your pieces, which is what Lasker goes for right now, because he has to, you know. Can't be, can't be down a pawn or two against Capablanca, he's going to win. All right, so f takes, and then he brings his rook on the second rank. And rook c2. So his rook is, is really menacing. 
And he's even threatening knight takes d4, right? Because the rook is, is overloaded. So this is enticing Lasker to move his knight. Uh, he prefers to go sort of passive here with knight d1. Uh, I can't say exactly why. I guess to stop rook b2. You know, that would be my, that would be my guess. Uh, but, you know, knight b5 is probably better, although black is, is probably winning in any case. So it shouldn't matter too much. Knight e7. Yeah, he's going to go to c6, right? Targeting the d-pawn and also, also the b-pawn, if it ever goes to b4. And knight c3. Okay, now here, uh, Capablanca actually is a way to more or less win a pawn by force, actually. But he, uh, he, he instead he goes for the check here. Uh, knight c6 is the way to go. And one idea is to even play knight b4. Although you could theoretically take on uh, even d4 here, right? But knight b4, rook d2 is a good idea as well. Pick up that pawn, right? Yeah, pick up that pawn. Should be a technical win if we clip the pawn, right? He, I mean, white still has weak pawns, and we'll have two connected pass pawns on, on e6 and d5. But something must have scared him off of knight c6, and he instead goes for the check. Yeah. Okay. And then knight c6. Right. So he still has the same idea. Knight takes d4. And again, Lasker goes for the more passive defense of knight d1 instead of knight b5. He even is probably not losing after knight b5. I did a little bit of analysis here. We can check it out. I thought, okay, let's target the b pawn, right? Because what else do we got? Now rook b1 is the idea. It's going to be difficult to defend the b pawn in that case. Not the only move, but knight a3 is a logical move, right? Stopping rook b1. Can't really lose the pawn, can we? Rook a1, you might think, okay, now we have to move the knight and it's rook back to b1. But we have b4. We have b4. Protecting the knight and attacking. And probably black's still better here, but um, he, he hasn't won the pawns, and he didn't really make progress. It's still just kind of like you'd rather have black because the pawns are split. It's far from a technical win. In fact, uh, I think the engine was even giving maybe less than a pawn advantage here. But still, obviously, good winning chances. But yeah, he goes for knight d1. He prefers this more passive move, which is pretty weird, in my opinion. But he must have had some reason for it. You know, again, like to cover b2, for example, although I don't think it's as relevant here as, you know, the other time I said that. But all right, so he goes for rook b1. And now even uh, Lasker makes a tactical blunder. He goes for king e2. Let's see who can uh, unmute their microphone and tell me what Capablanca played. Uh, rook takes uh, pawn on b3. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely correct. Rook takes b3. Yeah. Pretty big blunder, right? You get the fork at the end with knight d4, which would uh, even lose two pawns, so you do better not to take the rook. Well, that was obviously uh, a mistake, but even after like king e1, for example, he should still be losing in the long term. Something like this. Rook a1 is a good move. The rook is just really good on a1. Um, and, and this should be losing, but he still he didn't win the pawn yet, and he still has work to do to, to make the win, right? So you'd prefer to defend this way. Yeah, not that rook a1 was forced, by the way, but I thought it was a nice move. Yeah. Yeah, I like rook a1. But anyways, he played king e2. And now we can just admire the Cuban's technique, right? He makes it look like just, uh, just signing the, the certification documents that he's going to win the game at this point. Yeah.
Yeah, and you know he's going to take his sweet time about it. Because what's the guy going to do? Going to shuffle his rook back and forth. <laughs> I like that. All right, now he goes for e5, yeah. I mean, there's more than one way to go, but he just brings his king up very directly. And the pass d pawn is definitely going to win the game. Just resigns here at this point, yeah. The d pawn is, is going to win. And, and white is hopelessly passive. You know, he can never play, for example, knight f3 even, because rook f2 check. Um, but anyways, yeah, the pass d pawn will win, so he just resigns. So a really good example of, of the downside of having weak pawns the way that Lasker did. His pawns on the D and B files were always weak, and this allowed black, when he's attacking them, you know, to pacify white's pieces. White had to play passively to defend the pawns, and black can maneuver around and around uh, until one of he, he actually just dropped him with a tactic, actually. So that's, this is a, a pretty like quintessential example of the problem with weak pawns, I would say. And so, good start, I thought, to the lecture. Um, all right, we can, oh, do, maybe you have a question, somebody? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. So, if we have a question, can we just, like, unmute and ask? Totally, or, totally, yeah. Like, I, don't, I don't want to seem like we're interrupting. No, no, that's you know? totally fine. Yeah, you should participate. I would encourage participation. Okay. Did you have okay. a question about this game at some point? I can, we can go over it. You know, okay. Well, I'll move on to the next game then. We'll actually be looking at one of my own games. No. Let's flip it. Nice. So this is a pretty good practical example, even though, uh, you know, myself and my opponent were not nearly as good as, as the world champions that we looked at. Uh, you can get a situation like this in a, in a practical game, uh, especially if your opponent is, is willing or, or aiming to play for a draw, which, uh, you know, my opponent, he traded a lot of pieces here in this game, and, um, well, I guess I did too, right? <laughs> like, but, you know, I felt like I, I couldn't really avoid the trades, I guess, but I always knew in the back of my mind that we could get an end game where I, I strictly have a better pawn structure, and this is what ended up happening. We have this very symmetrical game, uh, but, of course, my opponent has doubled isolated e-pawns, and it looks like it shouldn't be a big deal. You know, double pawns are, are sometimes pretty bad, uh, but there are certain reasons why they could be bad. And in these pawns, they might not be as bad as, as a general double pawn. I'll, I'll show you, like, give you an example. Let's say like this pawn was over here on c6, right? Imagine that for me for a second. That would actually be worse for black than this current structure uh, because of the pawn majorities. Black would have four pawns against three on the queen side if the pawn was on c6, and can't make a passed pawn in that case. But my four against three on the king side can make a passed pawn. I could just break with f4, you know, and I get a passed pawn guaranteed. So in that scenario, it's pretty clear that the passed pawn is, is a, or the, rather the doubled pawn, is, is a hindrance because you can't make a passed pawn. But here it's not the case. Both sides have you know, four pawns on the king side and three on the queen side. So nobody has a majority. And uh, sometimes, you know, double pawns are, are themselves weak in that we can attack them and the opponent has to defend them, sort of like how we saw uh, Capablanca just do to Lasker with his isolated pawns. Uh, but in this case, even, you'd notice that it's not very easy for white to attack the pawns. So, I mean, we only have one knight each, and he's just defending with his king and knight. So it's going to take a lot, of, uh, a lot of work to prove that I can win this position. And of course, with, with best play, it should be a draw. But if anybody's better, you'd imagine it's white, right? I mean, how, how could he not be better? So all right, h5. Yeah. Now, of course, I don't want him to play h4, weakening f4. Then my knight would be tied down to the f4 square, because I can never let him go here and take my h-pawn, right? So that's sort of a positional threat. I had to, I had to, to stop that threat with h4 myself. Okay, but now my opponent actually plays a dubious move. So I was hoping that, you guys, you don't have to calculate too much here because it's not a lot of forcing moves, right? But I was just hoping you'd give me some candidate moves for black. Pretty 
probably like 97, hoping to reroute the knight on the queen side. I love right it. Right now, it's kind of blocked in. No. Uh, yeah. Movement. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the knight is is poorly placed, so I th I agree with rerouting it. Knight e7 is I think the first candidate move I had. You could even consider other knight maneuvers like knight h8, even to f7, potentially to d6. Or even maybe knight f8 to d7 and going out. I mean, m maneuvering the knight is totally logical. Absolutely. It's a knight endgame, so you might want your knights to be active. Certainly. Yeah, th those would be good candidate moves. If you were thinking about moving the king, then all right. I mean, even a king moves okay. But what my opponent did actually made it easier for me to try to win. He played a5. Which, um, you know, looking, looking through the game, I, I understood now why he did that. Uh, he wants to get this formation with b6, c5, and hope that I can't infiltrate somehow. But it, it makes it actually easier for me to infiltrate, as it turns out. And generally, he shouldn't be pushing the pawns because it makes it easier for me to make pawn breaks. Wait, so not, why not c5 first? Oh, and then like anyways, I mean, I don't think he should do any of that. So, you know, so, wait, I, I, so like, why not though? Well, okay. Well, I mean, either way, we'll see how, how it goes. I'm going to break down that formation pretty easily uh, as we'll see. So yeah, he should basically just do nothing. Maneuver his knight, make no commitments and make me have to somehow break in on, on one side of the board or the other using some well-timed pawn breaks. But as you could imagine, it, it's you know, not generally not going to be winning for white. But still something to play for. I could try to make pawn breaks on both sides of the board. But he makes it easier for me with a5. Yeah, I give a lot of candidate moves there, as you can see. Knight e7, king c6, you know, just random moves. But, but not a5. Shouldn't do that. And uh, so now the idea is to break with b4. Which, by the way, you could play b4 here. That's a good move. I played a4 first. Um, just because I was concerned during the game about b4, a4. Uh, because then he could try to close it down, right? I, don't, I really don't want it to be closed down. Although I think I could probably play something like this to, to try to punish that. But anyways, a4 or b4, both. That's the right idea, just to play b4 eventually. And then, yeah, 97. And I did play b4. And yeah, even here, he's not losing. He's doing all right. I mean, he's surviving with best play. Uh, but his next move definitely helps me out again. And I certainly was not expecting this one, by the way. C5. I mean, he must have been hoping, I think, for B5, right? That'd be like, that'd be like a Christmas gift, me playing B5. There's no way. There's just no way. So probably the best move is, I think, Knight C6. Yeah. Knight C6, just defending his A pawn, sort of enticing me to, to push, right, if I want which I could, I totally could, but he'll just go back. And okay, I need to try to make a break here, right? I could try to do that. But So is f4 a move in this position or do you wanna keep that doubled pawn on e5? That's a good question. At some point I am going to, going to need to break on the king side, but I don't need to commit to that yet. Right? I don't need to commit to anything on the king side yet. Um, the king side sort of established as it is, and, and I'm trying to see if I can make anything go on, on the queen side. If I can win on both sides of the board, then I'll probably win. Right. So th that's sort of my long-term goal, but we will be breaking on the king side, don't you worry. And <laughs> don't you worry, we will be doing that as well. Um, I also looked at, by the way, knight c6, just king c4, which is probably what I would have played. Um, but I actually couldn't make progress here, I, I remember. Like this, this looks pretty promising, I thought. But he can actually check. And then if I go in, he just goes back. Threatening b4, right? Threatening b4. So, yeah, actually maybe I could just go back myself. Right, but then we repeat. 
Well, I think I see an interesting variation. So, the uh, move where your king is on c4. Oh, yeah, here. Yeah, so what about a b4, c b4, and then your knight is kind of locked down to d4 because right, he wants to play knight d4 and somehow get on to the king's country. Oh, instead of so b6, you want, you want a b. Yeah, a b c d. And then now your knight's kind of stuck guarding the d4 square. Yeah, that is true. I was just thinking maybe I could try to kick you, and if you give the check, king b4. But th yeah. then it will be difficult for me to break on the queen side after you just play b6, though. But may maybe I could try to play on the king side then, as, as in the game. So maybe I, I would maybe do all that. But yeah, I'm sort of happy. I, I feel like I've made inroads. Uh, there's, it's an asymmetrical structure on the queen side now. So theoretically, I could get a pass pawn going. But, uh, well, maybe if you, if you blockade with b6, it's going to be more difficult. But, yeah, okay, I mean, I still have chances to play here, yeah, after knight c6. But uh, c5 was his choice. Let's see if you can punish this move. White to play, what would you, what would you go for? Don't, please don't say b5. <laughs> please don't say b5. I'm assuming B takes A5. I'm assuming. Winning a pawn. Yeah, you win the pawn, but um, I'm, I'm thinking his plan is like at any time you want to push to A6 is just going to take his lack of construction. Um, but you still have that opportunity. Well, anyways, after B A, what would uh, what would Black play? Uh oh, well, Knight C6. Yeah. So what are you going to do about that after that? Uh, resign. Oh, <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know about that. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's certainly a variation. I mean, do you have other candidate moves for white? Uh, there's either bc5 or f4, g4, I suppose. Yeah. I think f4 is probably the best move. Yeah, you love f4. I do like F4, but now I'm realizing that he can take twice on uh, B4. Yeah, I think he's happy to do that even if it's a trade, because he likes to trade the pawns. Right. That's a common uh, defensive technique. If there's less pawns on the board, there's less winning chances. But I actually did go for BA. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, and here comes the king. So I, made, I gave myself weak pawns. But I am going for king activity. I want to target his b-pawn, and then I'll promote my a-pawn, of course, if I take it. Pretty tricky move here, c4. Yeah, now obviously if I take his b-pawn, it's fork town, right? So I, I, don't, I don't really want to trade those pawns. That's, you know, if that's the only way forward, maybe, but... But that, you know, I don't, I don't really want to do that. So now I'm going to play on the king side, right? Now I'm going to play on the king side. I can't really make any more progress on the queen side. My king's as good as can be. And, uh, well, I did play a5 just to improve a little bit. Yeah, I think I did. Yes, yes. Just to improve, I played a5. But my plan is obviously on the king side. And we've got two pawn break options, f4 or g4. Um... Again, we've got to consider making a passed pawn. Right? That, that's really our, our end result here with white. And if we want to make a passed pawn, the break that we are going to go for is g4. And I'll tell you why. If, if black takes and we take, then we'll get two against one on the king side. Clearly, two against one. And then we're going to make a passed pawn if we have a majority. Now, if we consider from the other perspective, like let's say we're playing f4, if we end up taking it at some point, assuming we play g takes, I mean, because not playing g takes would be a symmetrical structure. You know, but we might play knight takes in this case just to hit the, hit the pawn. Yeah, on h5, now that I'm looking and at it. Knight d2, knight d2 after that, hitting e4. Right, then it's just kind of complicated. <laughs> yeah, then it's just complicated because all the pawns are hanging like this. And, and th these are all hanging too. 
But in general terms, playing f4, if we take and take, we, we won't be making a pass pawn. Right? If we play f5 and takes and takes, we, we still haven't made a pass pawn. So g4, with the idea to force him to play hg, which he, he didn't do that, obviously, because he doesn't have to. Uh, he just played king c8, I think, yeah. But now we make him play hg. Right? If he plays g6, we'll just play g takes h and, and knight takes h, h5 and get a pass pawn by winning a pawn, which is even better for us. So he has to do this. And now finally, in this position, we have finally exploited our opponent's bad pawn structure. We have two against one, and he, this is his two against one. Ridiculous. That's not going to help. <laughs> that is not helpful. But we're just going to make a pass pawn on the king's side. The game's already over. Really, it's just a matter of technique at this point. Yeah, he did his best here. Right? Yeah, there's a lot of ways to win this. We can just uh, we can just go through what I went for. King c5, just to take the pawn. Not even necessary, but I thought I might as well take the pawn because now I got two against one on each side. I'm certainly going to win then. Yeah, now this is even Zugzwang. If he moves his king, our king can step forward. Uh, I guess he could play b6, but then I'll play a6, right? Yeah, b6, a6 wouldn't be great for him. Um, even if he plays b5, check king b4, a7. Uh, I mean, king b6, a7, king takes. Well, I'll just put that on the board. <laughs> right. This is what I was calculating here. There. I'm happy that I made a pass pawn, at least. But I could even just trade on b6 and make a pass pawn, I guess. But yeah, he, anyways, he moves his knight, right? Because uh, that's the other thing to do. But then my knight can follow him. It's kind of funny how that where I'm like two squares behind him, but I keep following him with my knight. Yeah. Check. The problem, though, for him is that his e-pawn is still hanging, so he has to go back. Yeah. All right, maybe you guys can find this move, white to play. Assuming it's king c4 to go b5, b6, something like that. Well, that's a good idea, but we can just win the game immediately. After my next move, he resigned. I was gonna go just g6. Well, g6, you let him get up a blockade, right? Knight h6. Oh, I'm. Um, right. What? Knight where? H6. G6, knight oh, h6. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, g6 would be good in my variation, because if it was like king c4 and you went like c6, then g6 would take away the knight, you would win the pawn on e5. But, I mean, I don't think you can go h6 now, because he just takes, takes, and then he can take with the knight. Yeah, that's, tr that's true in that variation, but you can play a better move for white after h6, gh. Oh, g6. g6. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the knight has to move, and then you can promote. Exactly right. And he can't go to h6 because a pawn is there. <laughs> How funny yeah. is that? The, the traitor pawn. After h6, he resigned. If he takes it, I'll play g6, and he can't stop my pawn. Oh, uh, yeah. Classic trick here. What's funny is he can't even just lose the knight. Watch here. F, I mean, g7. <laughs> g7. Now the knight blocks the king from entry. Yeah, it's too funny. That's, that's too funny that, yeah. that they all block each other. It's like, in, uh, it's like in baseball when all the outfielders are looking for a pop fly and they run into uh, each and, other. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what it's like. But obviously he could just, if he wants to give up his knight, he would just play knight takes here. But that's, uh, yeah, that's not acceptable. So h6 ends the game, resigns, is appropriate. But yeah, that was a pretty nice game by me, if I, if I do say so myself. <laughs> I only had a small advantage, but my opponent helped me out a little bit. Playing a5 and c5, made it easier for me to break through. Uh, he was hoping to set up on the dark squares there, but I did just take it and run my king up. Even though I gave myself some weak pawns, uh, they weren't as important as king activity. And that is something that I wanted to mention for this lecture. 
A lot of times, lower rated players, they care so much about weak bonds, but activity is extremely important. And I feel like a lot of lower rated players would dismiss B takes A because they don't want to give themselves all isolated pawns. But it's the best move, and it's the easiest way to break up the queen side and get in there with our king. And that's the most important thing. Because then when he's tied down on the queen side, we win on the king side. And we win on both sides of the board. Karpov style. But all right, let's continue on to the next game then. This is going to be... Uh, no, this is going to be the most difficult example. It's uh, Masaitse against McShane. So these are some really heavy hitters. Um, you know, McShane's been at the been playing top players. He's beaten Magnus more than once, I think. Um, he, I thought he actually had a good record against Magnus, if I remember right. Uh, Masaitse, okay, maybe he hasn't played so many elite GMs, but he's still extremely strong. Uh, here, Black played the best move. Yep, takes back. And we enter this bit rook and bishop endgame, where both sides have some weak pawns, potentially. I mean, clearly, that's a weak pawn, right? No doubt, it's isolated, just like we saw with Lasker. But he's also got a backwards pawn here. That's, that's causing Black some difficulty. Black has to defend that pawn, and it's tough for him to get his rook active, for example, because he, he'd lose his e-pawn, which is not acceptable. Now, white, his pawn structure's not perfect either, right? His, he has a backwards c-pawn here, and it could be a scenario where he's got these two pawns and he has to defend them, um, like in a rook endgame. He has to defend them passively with his rook. And even, by the way, if he wins a pawn, and it's a rook endgame, it'll be rook and five against rook and four, not necessarily an automatic win, right? In, in rook, rook and pawn endgames, we, we can be down a pawn and it's a draw. Very often that is the case, especially if you, know, you don't have a pass pawn yet. You'll have to trade more pawns to get a pass pawn. So, yeah, I, I, it's not a win yet, but it's a difficult defense for McShane, to say the least. Let's see how it continues. Bishop e2. Yeah, and now this is a really nice, uh, nice technique here by Masaitse. Like, obviously you want to play rook b4, right? Just go collect the pawn. Seems like it's easy enough. But then rook f5? Oh no, he actually... Yeah, rook f5 would be right. Well, that, I mean... Attack uh, d5. Yeah, but bishop takes b5. You know. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You're right. yeah. Frankly, obviously, frankly. So, yeah. The, actually, black will get active, though, with, a, with rook f8. I give this variation. Uh, we could take a look at it. But Masaitsa does go for uh, just an improving move here, king f1. The idea is he's just going to make his position better because if rook b4, this lets the rook off of e7 with rook f8, which is actually a, a strong move because notice after this, you're actually losing the pawn back. White can't hold on to the pawn anymore. Rook b3, rook c5. So Masaitsa understands that. And again, white's own weak pawn in that variation is coming back to haunt him. He can't just go collect b5 like it looks like he can because he's got a weak c-pawn. So all he does is improve, right? You don't want to trade the pawns, of course. You're trying to, trying to win. You don't want to trade the c-pawn for the b-pawn like that. So king f1, just improving. Very patient stuff. And this was a, a, a nice move because you might think, okay, black will just defend his pawn and then move his rook. But if you play king f8, then you can't play rook f8. Those are the rules. Two pieces can't occupy the same square. So he goes for king g7, just to step the king up to f6. And then he can move his rook to f8. Both sides get their king active. King f6. And now that the pawn's defended, he might as well go over and win, because he's no longer holding the rook down here. The rook's already free to go. It might seem like rook f4 check would win a tempo. Like we force the king back and then do it, right? But now we do have Dean's idea, I believe. Yes, rook f5. And even though he will win the pawn, see, we give him, this is actually a crucial check, right? Because if he goes to the d file, we take the pawn with a check. And I mean, even king d1 would lose material. So he has to go back. But even this position, like I was mentioning, this is not very easy to win at all. Yeah, king f6. 
most likely result here is a draw. He doesn't have a pass pawn, and black's rook is really good. And black also forced white's king to the f-file for that tactical reason with that intermezzo check on e5. So the king can't go around and try to, try to assist like king d4, c5 or something. Well, not without some, uh, some assistance, I guess, somehow. Like maybe bring the rook back. But okay, then you, your d-pawn's hanging or your c-pawn might be weak. So yeah, it's tough for, it, it, probably it's a draw, probably with perfect play. Of course, I wouldn't be agreeing to a draw up a pawn, you know. Yeah. So he doesn't give the check, because he doesn't want to rook f5, simply. He just goes here without that. Logical stuff. Logical stuff. King e5. Hitting the pawn. But we get to take it and protect our pawn. Yeah, rook f4, just looking at my notes here, making sure I'm not missing anything. Yeah, okay, these, these moves, I don't have any, any notes, really. Rook f4, yeah, g5 is possible, but rook f4 is not bad. We'll see, we'll see that McShane is, like, really patient in defense. He doesn't mind to sit still and do nothing. Um, but an idea for black is to trade the pawns by playing g5, g4, as you might imagine. Like I said earlier, trading the pawns is a good defensive idea. So yeah, g5 here was playable as well. Now Masaita plays an interesting move. He goes for king d3 instead of king e3. Uh, in my opinion, he's like enticing black to play king f4. If you see what I mean, like king e3 would have stopped king f4, but he's playing king d3. Like, don't you want to play king f4? You know, don't you want to get your king in there? Which McShane does play king f4. But I think that's actually a little bit a little bit of a mistake. I mean, he should still draw. He should still draw, but he can almost force a draw here. Let's see if I'm just making sure I'm getting my variation correct here. Yeah, yeah, this is the moment. Rook b8. Just playing actively. Like I said, McShane doesn't mind to sit sit still and, and, and force white to make progress. Or, you know, put the onus on white to make progress. Um, but rook b8 actually should make a draw um, in a very interesting variation. Let's take a look. Rook a7, right? Because he, here's the deal. He's going to get active with rook b2, right, anyway. So we might as well play rook a7 ourselves at this point. And the deal is that your g-pawn is hanging, right? But if you play g4, rook h2, as I point out here, g4, rook h2 is going to win a pawn. You know, your h-pawn's gone. So rookie two here? So rookie two, exactly. So rookie two. But this king and pawn end game is shockingly a draw. We'll take the he, rook. He takes, takes, and then he goes like king c4. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but then there's a key move here. Right. H4. Yeah. Locking down white's majority. And it's actually a draw. Yeah, because after f4, there's d5, and it's like zeng zwang, right? F4, D4. To try to play D4, yeah. In fact, it's probably better not to play F4 because then you'll lose your, your F-pawn, maybe. So it, it, white does better to do nothing. Wow. But even black can just play, for example, King B5 and King C5. And now white can't make any progress. It, white has to use the king to make progress on the king side. But if you do that, then I'll run up and win your C-pawn. Mm -hmm. So you can't uh, you can't make any progress here without without the help of the king, but you can't use your king to help, so it's a draw. Now, generally, being a pawn down in a king and pawn end game is just uh, uh, you know lost, like just dead lost. But this would be one example where it's an exception because of the the structure on the on the king side. H four is the key move to lock down those pawns. Yeah. So pretty instructive stuff. Now, possibly McShane was considering rook b8 to b2, and he saw that it could be a king and pawn endgame, and he just didn't believe that he could draw that. So he stopped analyzing with black and thought, okay, let me just uh, play king f4. You know, just sort of sit tight and not change the character of the position and, and improve the king. And okay, if he lets me take the king side, then that's, you know, added bonus, right? Yeah. All right, so... 
you know, king f4, rook a7, and McShane goes for rook e8. He's trying to actually keep the option of rook b8 open. That's why he chose this uh, more passive looking move, you know, as opposed to, for example, rook f5, which would attack the d pawn. Probably white doesn't want to trade the e pawn for the d pawn. I don't think white would, would benefit from that trade. Uh, but obviously, if you defend the pawn somehow, like with the pawn or the king, I'll play rook e5, which you might consider that a more active defense than playing rook e8, which is what McShane did. But like I said, McShane wants to keep the option of rook b8 open. That's why he chose this. And it should still draw, and I think it's okay. I think it's, it's not even, should be considered a dubious move. Yeah, and, and he wants to, fi he finally is going to trade the pawns, right? Rook a2. Yeah, now that you, you uh, let him off of his weak e pawn, remember that is still a backwards pawn, and, and black had to play passively to, to defend it, but now black can actually run out because the, uh, the e pawn is no longer under pressure. Other moves lose, as it turns out. Rook b8 is the only defense. For example, g4, that's a move that we'd all love to play, but we will get a pass pawn with white on the king side. Yeah, this is a good move. And this should be actually a win. Even though three against two is usually a draw, uh, we already have a passed pawn, and still the e pawn is weak as well. It's a little bit of an added bonus. And, and this should be enough to win generally. And I, you know, I didn't do a lot of analysis on it because you know, we'd be here all day analyzing that, really. <laughs> it's pretty complicated stuff. Also a move to consider is e6, right? I like to look at pawn breaks, you know me. But yeah, rook e1 is a strong response, right? We can actually win quite easily with c5. A nice pawn break again. And king c4. The d pawn's just going to win. King c5, d6, mainly, etc. So McShane does well to avoid those tempting pawn breaks. Again, we, we want to trade pawns when we're worse. For example, rook and pawn against rook is is going to be a draw, you know, but in this case, trading pawns was, was losing in all cases, so he goes for rook b8. Nice, getting active. It's important to play actively at all times, if possible. Yeah. Still has to defend. Rook e6, okay. Yeah, king d4 is an option to try to play c5, but maybe he was getting concerned about rook b4 check, right? Yeah. Okay, but rookie six actually is kind of a tricky move because he's uh, enticing the opponent to, to play king g3, right? Because now that the g2 pawn is, is undefended, he's like, don't you want to you try to get there, you know? Attack that pawn. Um, but king g3 probably is worse, yeah. He plays h4, that's a good move. King g3, we'll see that this actually will lead to a winning position like this. And... Um, again, you probably don't want to give him a passed h-pawn, right? But if you take here, like this, this is actually a win even here. Rook and three against rook and two. Um, which I wasn't convinced, actually, on, on my own. And I did some analysis, and eventually I was convinced. Um, the idea for white is to bring the rook to f7. Then we'll push our pawn. And your king is just terribly placed. This king is, is in a horrible place. And if you step the king up, okay, if you do nothing, I play here and I play f6 and, and it's over. Or, you know, I'll, I won't let you check me, so I'll play king d4 first. But I'll play rook f7, f6, and I'll win if you do nothing. But if you step your king up when I push my pawn up, I'll get my king in there. I'll play rook g7 check. I mean, your king's going to be on the h file. I can even step my king into e6. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to collect and win. You're going to be basically be playing without a king on h5. And again, if we can accrue more advantages, we have more chances to win up a pawn. You know, we're up a pawn and we can collect e7 and their kings on the h file. It's probably enough to win. Anyways, this is something black should avoid. <laughs> Even if you can't really be sure when you're playing the game, right? You don't know, like, is this a technical win or not? Y you know, you can't really know. But you probably should avoid that if possible. So he doesn't play king g3. He just plays h4. Again, McShane doesn't mind to keep 
the structure the same uh, if, and just make white make progress. Like somehow you have to win. I'm not going to just change the position and let you win. Okay, let's see. We got a couple moves here. Check. I like this. He plays king e3, then always repeat, right? <laughs> For no reason. King d4. Now he's trying to play c5. So rook c7. Um, if you want to get active this way, it should actually lose. Takes. Yeah. Yeah, this is an interesting variation. Okay, we, we saw this coming, right? C5. Here comes the d-pawn. It looks messy, doesn't it? The guy can go back, try to prevent us from queening with, with rook d1, right? But we can help with our king. Now, it seems like uh, who knows what's going on here, but we can actually clarify the situation. So here's what white's going to do. It's pretty obvious, right? King takes c5, king c6, and d7, rook d8, or d7, rook e8, queen, or king c7, d7, d8. He's going to use the king to usher the pawn forward, basically. Plus, I assume if he goes king f6 in this position, you just want to get your rook behind the king, so rook e3 to d3. Uh, and that way you can promote the pawn, right? Well, maybe, maybe. I might do that, but I actually know of another idea. I'll show you. Here, you know, because now black is just trying to take the pawn. Black's trying to get counterplay. I'm not just going to let you do this and I'm going to sit on my hands, then I'll lose. So he's going to take here and play g4, right? And then here comes counterplay. But white can extinguish all counterplay with a little tactical trick. Rook e4 check. X-clam. Like, what? Hold on a minute. Making the guy take the pawn? What are you talking about? But then it's rook g4. It's rook g4. X-clam. And this ends the game. So he here's the ideas. Let's say we take and try to queen, but we lose tactically at the end. Right? Oh, yeah. Queen d5. Scary. Yes. Or a8. I'd play a8 just for style points, you know, <laughs> the, yeah. the longer skewer. Okay, so fine, that loses. I get it. So we'll just move our rook, right, and do something. No, because I'll take and I'll queen, and you have no counterplay. Your king can't do anything. Your two against one is stuffed, and you lost. It's lost. I'll win with my extra pawn. Really nice variation there. Rook e4 check, rook g4, and wins. Yeah, tough stuff. So rook b2 loses. All right, because I mean, what else are you going to do? Obviously, rook b2, you're going to, you're going to take. You could just take this pit stop, right? Just so, so c5, you can't take with the king. You might think I could take at once, but then c5 is even, even stronger, I guess. Oh no, maybe you could play rook d2 check after c5. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you could try that, right? Because then rook d2 check. Wait, what, what's the point there? Rook d2 check and... To take d5. Oh, okay. Then I'll play rook c2 check and take c5. Oh. Okay. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, actually. I didn't analyze this. This might be a good idea. Yeah, because king, like we were saying, king c4, rook c2 check. And if, okay, so like king, king e2, rook takes d5, well, that's, c6? Well, that's you king e3, I guess, right. But then I'll even, yeah. Then you, yeah. This isn't winning, right? Uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like it is. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know, maybe you could defend differently there. Right, maybe you could defend differently there. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's, it still should be winning somehow. It still should be winning. Maybe c5 is too premature. But I wouldn't want to move my king because after rook d2 check, I moved my king. So I would give you an extra tempo if I make a king move in that case. So the only other moves like that make sense are to go like this, right? Yeah. I mean, if I take the pawn and two connected pass pawns, that's generally going to win. But okay, I mean, like I said, we could kind of analyze this all day. 
I don't want to spend too much time on any one position. Because rook c7 is the move that you'd expect anyway. The guy's trying to play c5, so let's just, let's just pause. And again, McShane's just trying to hold the position steady, if possible. Okay, we got a, a few moves in a row here with no comment. Yeah, he finally plays f4. He finally does something, right? He changes the structure. He couldn't make any more progress there without a pawn break. Yeah, rook g7. King f6. Like this. Yeah, these moves all make sense. Here comes the h-pawn. Yeah, a little hip check to the king there. Rook h8. Yeah. And rook h2. I also looked at king f6. Like this. Yeah, I don't really remember this variation. Rook e1, okay. Yeah, because like this, this will, this will win, right? He can't push his f-pawn and we'll go take his d-pawn. Or even just play c5 and, and promote our d-pawn. So he has to play, again, this is like another example of the weak pawn. We have to play a passive move rook e1 instead of taking and making a pass pawn of our own. And now this position, okay, again, generally you're gonna consider this to be lost. It's an extra passed pawn, and still e7 is weak, so we can potentially make another passed pawn. And his king is terrible on h6. Yeah, so he played rook h2. Again, he's just trying to collect the g-pawn and push his f-pawn. Let's see, I think that he's still okay here. Right, he's still okay here. It's tough, it's like on the razor's edge. Is it a draw or is it losing? I'm sure the players had no idea during the game. Goes for h7. Yeah, rook f7, he can give this check and back like this. So you're gonna lose one pawn anyway. Even if you go, for example, rook f6, and here, you lose, you lose the pawn, and, and it's going to be a draw then. Obviously, rook and pawn against rook. Like I said, usually a draw, but okay, white's king is, is so terrible. It's an automatic draw, pretty much. So he goes to h7. Yeah. f3. Still complicated here. Like I said, it's not clear who's, if it's a win or if it's a draw yet. Okay, and c5. And finally here, after so much defending, McShane makes the decisive mistake. He takes. Innocent mistake, right? He should play f2. Now the refutation of this is, is quite stunning. King c3. Opposition. <laughs> Opposition. Yeah, doesn't care about the C-pawn. But this is, this is winning in all variations, as we'll see. Here. He queens. Okay, rook h7. That's a tricky move, right? But we'll just take it. And if you queen, I check and take your queen. This is the point of king c3. Genius stuff. Genius stuff by Masaitse. Really. And then obviously wins. Yeah. That is the tactical point. So he tries this. But we've all been here before, right? <laughs> Lucina position. Classic Lucina position. Technical win. There it is. Yep, we all know this technique, right? We all know this technique. And resigns. Great stuff by Masaitse. And it was good defense by McShane as well. But just at the end, he missed one extremely deep idea right at the very end. 
I mean, I'm sure he never considered king c3, right? I mean, you would just play king c5 automatic, or if you're analyzing in your head, you're like, takes king c5, and then what? But king c3, really great stuff. Yeah, yeah, this, was, this is the key variation. Yeah. And then wins with the Lucy in a position. Now, okay, uh, McShane, I guess he could have defended a little better because he could have played that, that rook b8 earlier and forced the draw pretty much. Uh, but he had to understand the king and pawn end game was a draw down a pawn, which it, it almost always is not. So again, we can sort of, uh, we can excuse that mistake. But really good play by Masaitsa. He put maximum pressure. He had all these little ideas. And, and at the last minute, McShane messed it up, unfortunately, by missing that king c3 idea. But all right, I hope you guys learned a lot about weak pawns. We looked at isolated pawns, doubled pawns, backwards pawns. I couldn't do any better than that. <laughs> what else? What else could I have I've shown you? I think that's about it. Um, you know, maybe tripled pawns, but okay, come on. It's just a variant of doubled pawns. Let's, let's be real. <laughs> but all right, that's all I had for you today. If you enjoyed, please consider to leave a like and subscribe to the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta's YouTube. Thanks. Bye-bye.